The 2A receptor is massively expressed in the cortex. It's particularly expressed on layer 5 pyramidal cells and on, on the fast spiking interneurons which regulate these cells. You can see them in, the, in this layer here in the, in the rat brain and the monkey brain. These receptors have evolved to control the parts of the brain which are really important to you and me, i.e. the cortex. But we don't know what they do. So we decided to find out what happens if we stimulate these receptors. And this is what happened. And, and it's completely unexpected. So this, this is one of those examples where you get the opposite effect to what you'd imagine. We assumed that giving someone cytosybing and letting them see a whole plethora of pretty colored images would activate the visual cortex, but it didn't. What it did was switch off the thalamus and switch off the default mode, the posterior and anterior cingulate cortices. Completely unexpected finding, which itself, that finding itself, tells you that study was worth doing. Because you could not have modeled that, no one would have expected that, but until someone did the experiment, you could never have known. And the magnitude of the uh, hallucinatory experience was um, predicted or correlated with the magnitude of the attenuation in brain blood flow. We did it two ways. We did an ASL study, and then we thought we'd better do a bold study. We did a bold study. We got the same results. And what cytosybin does is it switches off brain activity in these key connector hubs, the anterior and posterior cingulate cortex. These are the nodes of the brain which integrate func brain function, cortical function, uh, in the posterior of the visual and motor and sensory integration, and in the front, more the emotional and conscious sort of self-awareness integration. So psilocybin dampens down the parts of the brain which orchestrate and regulate cortical function, and let the brain therefore do its own thing. So it kind of liberates the brain. So you, under psilocybin, you're seeing brain activity that isn't constrained in the normal way in which the brain is constrained. And we thought that was really interesting. Interesting, the referee said, oh, well, this is just an effect on blood vessels because everyone knows that these drugs change blood vessels and blood flow. I kind of thought, well, if you can change blood flow and produce these effects, that's quite interesting in itself. But never mind, yeah. We're all neuroscientists. Let's go and do, let's see what happens to neurons. So we went on and we did a MEG study. And MEG just measures the changes in electric activity in neurons through changes in magnetic dipoles, as you know, and it's got very high temporal resolution. And we found essentially the same thing, this profound reduction in the power of the MEG signal across the frequency range, particularly in the posterior cingulate cortex and in these high frequencies or higher frequencies in the anterior cingulate cortex. So this, is, this confirms what we found with the BOLD and the ASL. These drugs profoundly alter the brain, but not all the brain, just these particular integrative hubs. And in fact, with MEG, we were able to do uh, a technique, use a technique called dynamic causal modeling with Carl Friston. And uh, we were able to evaluate this model of cortical function where you have a couple of pyramidal cells and a couple of interneurons which regulate them. And from the MEG signal, estimate that the predominant effect of psilocybin is on these deep layer 5 pyramidal cells. And I think that may be the first example where in a human you can actually point to an effect on brain function targeted at a particular cell type in the cortex. But another fascinating thing emerged from this was that psilocybin switched off this part of the brain called the subgenual anterior cingulate. Now this is a part of the brain which is intimately involved in depression. In fact, we know that a whole range of antidepressant treatments SSRI, CBT, ECT, switch off that part of the brain. That's the part of the brain which seems to drive depression. And we were surprised. We didn't expect that. But many of our subjects said even though they were taking this trip in a brain scanner, there were still beneficial effects on their sense of well-being for up to a few weeks later. And based on that and this, this, the parallelity with these other studies, we've got funding now to do a trial of psilocybin in depression. 
Now, again, you would never have thought of that doing that, I think, unless you'd actually had this evidence of the brain changes being meaningful in that disorder. We did MDMA because MDMA is the most promising treatment for chronic PTSD, treatment-resistant PTSD. And PTSD is a massive problem in society. It's a particularly big problem in societies where, that are at war. And this is an amazing statistic. More American soldiers have killed themselves since they've come back from Iraq and Afghanistan than have died in combat. And they've done it. They killed themselves because they're so psychologically damaged by the experience of either killing people randomly or being blown up or seeing their friends blown up by uh, improvised explosive devices. And the treatments we have for PTSD are rather poor. 